Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, today, we'll be talking about monorepos and how to control them. So, you know, a uh, cliche of every JavaScript conference presentation, show of hands, how many of you have recently slayed a multicephalic uh, creature with a sword and poison in production? OK. So we'll learn how to do that in production. So Hamlet famously said, to monorepo or to not monorepo, that is the question. Uh, the answer, of course, is not quite so simple. It's not a yes or no. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why you might want a monorepo. Uh, but first, we should probably talk about what a monorepo actually is. So mono stands for one, and repo would mean repository in this case. Uh, so it's a single repository that contains a bunch of other repositories. Uh, and you probably use a lot of tools that are uh, built as monorepos, React, Angular, Babel, et cetera. Those are all monorepos. And the reason why they're monorepos is probably because of a couple of those things down there. Uh, the code base is maintained by multiple people. Well, <laughs> that's probably a given if you work at a company or even on a large open source project. But the reason why that is important is because when you have multiple actors working on a singular code base, you often have it spread out into smaller chunks. So for example, uh, Babel has all sorts of different uh, plugins, you know, one for a pipeline operator, one for optional chaining syntaxes, things like that. So you have different people working on those small bits of the code, and that way, when they make those changes, they all happen at a singular source. The code comprises one system. Again, Babel is a great example. React is also a good example. They're all eventually packaged as one singular, unique thing. Uh, they have shared dependencies. Uh, you know, for example, if I use Lodash in my program and I use it across multiple different packages, well, oftentimes one of the big problems you run into is that those dependencies get out of sync. You know, you might be uh, using like a 0.3 version of something and then another part of your project uses 0.3.1 and there's a small breaking change in one. <laughs> Uh, so it's important to be able to detect those sort of things. Uh, and that's why having uh, a consistent way of managing dependencies across multiple packages is important. Uh, the packages are independent of each other. So they get exported in a way that you can import it into another uh, in a totally different part of the code base. And they're all sort of just small little chunks that build together. This is an important uh, aspect of maintaining modular systems. Uh, and hopefully those installs are deterministic. The reason why I bring that up is because I've seen it happen before where you maintain a monorepo uh, and you install everything and it breaks uh, completely randomly. And that's not <laughs> a good thing. Uh, so you want to ensure that you have installations that uh, you want to make sure you have installations that uh, don't have uh, external dependencies. Uh, a big example, of course, would be C++ bindings in Node. You want to make sure you don't have things like that. And if you do, you probably want to have that as a separate uh, repository and then have your monorepo just be the more simplistic parts. And finally, your project may have uh, similar release cycles. An example of that, again, would be something like Babel. Uh, when Babel gets released, the entire project gets released. It isn't just one small package being out of uh, having a different versioning schema than the rest. So those are all reasons that you would want a mono repo. And of course, the inverse is true. If you don't have those things, you maybe don't want a mono repo. Uh, and as you can see there, the beautiful work of art is Hercules and the Lernaean Hydra by Gustave Moreau. So some utilities for monorepo management. Bolt, Rush, Knit, these are all uh, useful, great tools that you can use uh, for your monorepos. In this talk specifically, we'll be talking about Lerna. And as you can see there, Lernaean Hydra, Lerna, get it? <laughs> uh, 
the reason why I chose to focus this talk on Lerna is really just because Lerna is uh, one of the more popular uh, systems for this. Uh, a Bolt Rush and it may also suit your needs. Uh, it's really not something I can judge. It's definitely above my pay grade. Uh, but yeah, and then as you can see, there is an aside on the structure of a monorepo. Most monorepo, uh, pretty much everyone that I have encountered has that similar structure where you have a, a top level directory called packages and inside packages are, well, your packages and those packages have their metadata or whatever else they need to export. So let's talk about Lerna and some of the commands. So Lerna is focused on three big things, which is dependency management, parallelization, and publishing. Uh, and what I mean by all of those things is that, first of all, you want your commands to be fast. You want them to be blazing fast. And a huge part of that is ensuring that they're all happening uh, in sync with each other. Um, you know, because you don't want to run a test command in 50 different packages, one after another. You want to run them simultaneously. And that's why ensuring that you have a modular code base is important, because you want to minimize uh, dependencies across your packages as much as possible. Uh, dependency management is also an important aspect of that. If you have a large library that you're loading into your node modules, it can become very costly very quickly to load it 50 different times or npm install it 50 different times. Uh, and with regards to publishing, oftentimes you want to ensure that you're keeping track of how these packages are being published, whether you want to have a singular versioning schema or separate versioning schemas, it doesn't matter. You want a release mechanism that's consistent. So the first command is learn to add, which really just adds a package that you specify, so React. And the way it works by default is that it'll add it to all of your packages that are present in your packages directory. Of course, you can configure it with scope and ignore, which I'll talk about later. Learn a bootstrap is the alternative here to npm install. Instead of using npm install, you'd use learn a bootstrap in order to ensure that all of your dependencies are uh, installed in your different packages. And the part of the reason for that is that you can run into a lot of issues with sim links uh, on some other package installers or package installation uh, scripts. Learna run uh, and Learna exec are both really useful commands and probably the main reason why I use monorepos at all because they allow you to have uh, common build steps, or well, I guess in a sense different build steps, but they're all named the same. So for example, if I have npm run build in all of my packages, then I can just use learn or run uh, build, and it'll run npm run build in every single one of my packages. And learn a exec is very similar in that it runs on all of your packages, except it can be something arbitrary. So learn to exec RIMRAF node modules in order to wipe out your node modules from all of your uh, packages folders. Possibly my favorite, one of my favorite things about Lerna because it allows you to import an external repository into uh, your current monorepo. So for example, if I had an external repository called add, uh, then I could just simply use learn to import and I would have my add package inside of my packages folder. Uh, and it would retain its git commit history. Uh, so that's incredibly useful. Uh, learn a link is used just to link dependencies across your packages. Uh, and then learn a publish is your preferred publishing mechanism here. Uh, and you can run it with conventional commits as well in order to ensure that your versioning makes sense. You know, if you have two different packages and in one package you make a breaking change, oftentimes you don't want to create a bit breaking change for both of your packages. You might just want to publish a breaking change to one package. And that's what doing conventional commits ensures. And then, of course, there are scope and ignore. So scope and ignore are counterparts. Scope ensures that it's scoped solely to your packages. 
So for example, if I have a sword and shield package, I can run scope equals sword to ensure that uh, learn is only targeting my sword package. And I could do ignore equals sword to ensure that it runs on every package except my sword package. So there are a couple of pitfalls that you can run into when using Lerna that you should be cautious of. The first is the initial refactor. Uh, moving everything around can get kind of taxing, especially when you're dealing with dozens of packages and you have to import your uh, Git history into all of them using import. I will say one thing I learned was that you can't actually import with a link to GitHub, you have to have the repository be local to your machine. And then using the workflow, uh, this is something that I personally found kind of frustrating because I'm so just used to typing npmi uh, as a shorthand for installing. Uh, but Yarn, or not Yarn, but Lerna kind of forces you to use Lerna Bootstrap or Lerna Exec in order to get the most out of it. Otherwise, you can run into certain issues where Yarn and NPM and Lerna all start fighting with each other, and then you have an actual Hydra on your hands. So that's something to avoid. Uh, singular Git histories. Uh, I wasn't sure if this is really a, a problem, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, when you have all of these monorepos, even if you're importing your Git history, it all becomes singular. It all becomes squashed down into a flat history. And then module resolution and hoisting. So Node's module resolution mechanics uh, can sometimes be at odds with the way Lerna resolves modules. And it'll almost certainly be at odds if you're using Webpack's resolution uh, for modules as well alongside that. Uh, hoisting, what I mean by that is that Lerna has a hoist option where you can choose to take a package and bring it all the way up to your top level directory. What this ensures, of course, is that you're only installing it once at that top level node modules, but you can quickly run into problems when you're trying to call it from somewhere or you're deeply nested into your project and you don't know where anything is and you wanna cry. That's, that's usually what happens to me. And then side effects. This, I think, is possibly the hardest and most annoying thing to deal with. This is a problem across really any modules. But it can be especially problematic here, and I'll show why. So here's a side effect inside a module. So we're doing, comp obviously, our actual export is just exporting an add function. But in the middle, we have this just awful junk uh, where we're modifying an invisible number, which is possibly a global, who knows? Uh, and we're reading from the file system, it's, it's not a good idea to have code like that, but you know we publish code like that all the time because it's not always clear where side effects are coming from. And so when you're exporting modules like this, it can be problematic because you're, if you're export, or importing them multiple times across multiple packages, you're essentially multiplying these side effects across your repository. Uh, this is, of course, why immutability and other uh, high-level concepts have become so attractive, uh, especially in the age of small modules. So I have some further reading. Uh, at my GitHub, you should see the slides for this presentation, including uh, links to example repositories. Uh, Learn a semantic release is an important tool. Uh, if you're, using, if you're used to semantic releases, so basically auto-publishing things once they pass your CI tests. And then uh, the Florida clip art website, uh, that's where I got all the clip art for this presentation. Uh, Learn as Wizard, uh, it's a great tool if you don't wanna have to manually type out all of those commands. And as a counter argument, why we dropped Lerna from PouchDB, which talks in depth about some of the issues that they ran into with Lerna at such a large scale, uh, and how they went about writing their own tool uh, and their own custom scripts in order to replace Lerna. So thank you.